In the Netherlands, and I don't know how it is in Canada or in, uh, in, in other places, but I find sometimes that anthropologists don't have much self-respect and uh, cannot really defend their, their trade or the specificity of their craft. And uh, it, uh, um, it, it, of, my, of my year, I know several people who don't even say they're anthropologists or trained as anthropologists. And um, there al always has been some si some sort of antagonism between um, uh, other social scientists who work more with quantitative, and of course I can say, well, they're quantitative anthropologists too, but um, for me, I'm not a quantitative anthropolog anthropologist as such, because I prefer qualitative uh, uh, methods. But even then, I think we have to uh, realize the value of doing qualitative research and to start on a small scale, to start even with one person or with one village and use that to say uh, something about the history of the, of the community and the, and, the, and, and, and the state at large. And um, a few, um, some time ago, I invited um, uh, a young anthropologist for uh, a dinner with retired social scientists. And she gave a, a wonderful lecture on uh, the use of uh, uh, selfies by uh, youngsters uh, in order to explore their sexuality. And then I heard one um, psychologist mumble, N is one. And I thought, this, this is really not fair. Um, of course, he might not have liked the topic of youngsters and sexuality, but um, at least she just finished explaining that her response group was far larger than one, and how she picked them, how she selected them, and on what grounds. And, um, but that because she wanted to illustrate the complexity of something, she had one extensive case study, this one person that he objected to and I um, and in in this way I, I think we are a little bit misjudged and sometimes suddenly an outsider discovers the value of qualitative um, a qualitative approach so there was this uh, uh, youth psychiatrist on television and he uh, he was telling how important it was not to just tick off the boxes of the um, of the list given in the DSM-5, uh, but instead first listen to your patient, understand the patient's relations with the parents, and um, really not deciding by your own categories, but let the patient uh, tell you how complicated the matter was and uh, what the problem was. So, in a way, we let others defend our discipline rather than we, that we uh, do it ourselves. And um, uh, say the, the, the best example, the first example I, I, I read about all the problems of doing qualitative research and the advantage of doing qualitative research was William Food White's uh, Street Corner Society and his uh, extensive appendix behind it. I, I think in the end the appendix became more famous uh, than, than the story before, before it. And so Henk and I, Henk de Riesse, uh, who is my partner since uh, 50 years, and I decided to write um, an article on small talk. And we called it the hard work of small talk. And it's all about anthropological self-respect and the value of time, patience and presence. And why is small talk so important? Um, 
uh, I really value the opportunity that anthropologists still have or take or fight for uh, to have a year-long cycle in the field and just stay there, sit there and, uh, and, and listen. And this has to do with the notion of the field. The field cannot be um, understood by making an image. You have to sort of make a film all through the year and if you if you hear something or see something on, at one moment, you might f see something totally different somewhat later. And um, only if you stay there for a long time, there um, um, you find out that there's a difference between what people say and what people do. And that can be a quite a, a big difference because what they say usually is their ideology of how the world should look like and what they do is how they actually deal with this world in everyday life. And um, there's also a difference between official figures and, um, and everyday facts in the sense of official figures, you only have to look at the COVID figures at the moment. We really don't know how many people died of COVID because a lot of COVID patients don't get counted because they uh, live in old age, age homes and were already dying anyway. And so they, they are not um, registered as COVID patients. But you find also these examples in anthropology. Uh, Lacoste du Jardin in the 70s studied uh, Algerian villages and she found that um, uh, a lot of the deaths were not registered. And why were they not registered? Because the people themselves were never registered. So their birth was not registered, so you could not register their deaths. And she, so she find, found out that there were many, many more, more deaths than, uh, than were known. And also Nancy Schipper Huge had so much trouble in the field uh, in her beautiful uh, book, Death Without Weeping. I don't know if you know that. Uh, uh, the, the problem of uh, women losing a lot of babies uh, uh, at, at a very early age. And then how do you know how many babies have died? Because no one takes notice of it and in the end she found a solution by counting the carton coffins that they used for the baby's burials in order to have some inkling of um, of what was ac actually happening on the field. So you have to be there a long time in order to find links to what is really happening. Um, also in order to to optimize serendipity. You have to be there a long time and create time and space for things to happen. Um, we were, um, we were, um, well maybe I should give that example later, but I remember one time we were studying rituals in Spain and the whole program was finished and I was, we were sitting in a, in a hotel room dead tired and uh, glad everything was over and then Hank said we have to go out and I said no I want to sleep no we have to go out I said everything is over the program is over no we have to go out. so we went out streets were empty and deserted there were a few people walking around with uh, some uh, flowers from the demolished uh, um, floats they had carried around and then Walking around, we suddenly saw a group of people waiting before a large door. So, what do you do as an anthropologist? You go up and you ask what they're waiting for. And actually, they were waiting. I, I, I had written an article about the participation of women in these rituals, and I was a very little, a little bit disappointed that I hadn't seen more than I had expected. And then more people came to watch and then suddenly the doors opened and then suddenly you had this float being carried out by all women. And to my great surprise, here were the women that I'd been looking for the whole week before and that I hadn't seen yet and suddenly they were there. And not only that, the woman I was, was standing next to me watching it, she said, well, didn't you know that they have to return all the images? So there's another one at three and the next one is at four and the next one is at five. And so we've been running all day going to the different places. And to my big surprise, 
every time the door opened, out came the women with their floats. So I would never had had this opportunity if I hadn't had the patience and the time and and someone else to convince me I really should go out after the things are over because you don't study rituals before and during but also after the ritual is over and what people do then. <coughs> so this allows you to see things that otherwise go and, and notice. We called it the hard work because it's really hard work to do small talk. It's hard because uh, first of all, uh, most of us don't speak the language or speak it deficiently or try to speak it as well as we can, but not perfectly. So it's very tiring to, to, to be able to talk and small talk is a thing you cannot do with an interpreter. With an interpreter you do interviews, but not small talk. Small talk is what you do if you sit in the bus or wait for the doors to open or, 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 or whatever. Um, and um, so it's hard for that reason for, for um, the language and um, uh, sometimes it's good you don't perfectly speak the language because then you're able to ask explanations repeatedly and otherwise people get tired of explaining to you all the time and say we told this to you already and you can say well you know I don't speak it very well and you also note, note special words that you haven't heard before and you, you hook up to them and ask them for information and they help you to find new concepts. Um, but that, that about the language. It's also difficult because I, many humans or many anthropologists have a certain shyness about them and um, I would say don't be afraid of your own shyness because it's a very good quality. It can be very ha helpful in the field because you don't immediately impose your views on the other but take time to listen to the other and let the other explain what they want to explain to you. But nevertheless it does make small talk difficult because you are the one who has to start all the time and once you start it the other people will talk but if you don't say anything they won't <laughs> usually say anything either and especially in the first days when you don't know anybody yet and um, and I told you about uh, Yasmina the first day I, uh, I came to this Algerian town and I went up to her and asked her for something and then you're happy that once you start and once you dare to to, uh, to pass this threshold, then it, it becomes easier. And uh, in, in, the, in, in the village in Algeria, uh, children were very uh, important in that context because they would come up to me and say, well, won't you go and see my mother? And I thought the mother had sent them, but sometimes she, she hadn't. So I dropped in unexpectedly, but for them, uh, it was very important to, to talk to me and to, uh, to to show to let to let me see their their world. <coughs> Another reason why it's hard it's because um, it's twenty four seven um, a task. You're doing small talk all the time wherever you are. You cannot just rest, and um, it's it's part part of the part of the deal. And um, also here I have examples and when we were in Spain, we were doing a, a whole day of interviewing and seeing people and then get home at two o'clock at night and be happy to be in bed. And then we heard them already coming, the youngsters with their songs. And then they would stop, you hear them stop before your door and they sing, <laughs> they, they sing for you. And it's very nice, but you really do have to get up and talk to them. and give them some drink before they before they're out. Um, we think small talk is also work because you have to do it systematically uh, and with systematically I mean you have to do it to get data and to show the diversity of data so once you get your data you have to check uh, with others if they see it the same but also if they maybe have another opinion about it. And um, so it's a form of triangulation of different sources and it's um, important uh, 
to to um, uh, to do that systematically and consistently. And then once you've done that for a whole day, you also have to write it down because small talk is also something you forget to write to write down because if you do an interview, you sit there with your either with your tape recorder or your notebook, and uh, small talk um, is not immediately seen as a data collection but it certainly is a form of data collection and checking and double checking and uh, as such it's uh, important work and uh, loads of books have been published about interviewing but we find no book or at least um, informal books or for social contact books about a small talk and uh, certainly not as a part of doing research because it's not respected as part of research because it's fake it's um, uh, it cannot be duplicated because what you hear once, yeah, then the person goes off and takes the train or the bus and you cannot ask them again. So it has this unscientific notion about it. Uh, while actually it's, it's very a core aspect of anthropology in, 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 in getting all the details and getting the intricacies of the, of the situation uh, in place. And um, no, and the, the last reason why it's also important is that it's for, for people to get in contact with you or to stay in contact with you, you have to behave as if you, as if you, you really live there, but you have to relate to them in the same way as the others relate to them. Before you start, field uh, before you start interviewing it's also important small talk f to learn the vocabulary uh, because we have learned the language you can use um, uh, a dictionary uh, if you don't know it enough but i have learned from experience that it can be very different in the field than what the official language is and my very first day i noticed that when i talked to my neighbor and I asked her, what do you ask? It's an easy question. How many children do you have? And then it depends on the word you use for children because there are many words for children. And apparently I used the word that she understood as boys. So she pointed out, I have this boy, this is my child. And then later on, a few girls dropped in and I said, well, these are probably the, the children of the neighbor. No, 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 they're also my children. So I said, so you have more than one child. Yes, I have more than one child. I have five children. And then two days later, another a young woman came to visit her. And then, uh, uh, of course, I noted down she has so many children. And then uh, this young woman came and then it turned out to be her married daughter. And again, she had not included the married daughter into my question of <laughs> the answer to my question of how many children. So it's very delicate what kind of terms you use. And some people use native in interpreters for that reason, because they, they should have the feel for the proper word. But they should also know then what you want to know. Do you want to know the children living at home or do you know include the married ones or, or not? And uh, the, the one way to contact people was also, I also always carried a photograph of my family. And since I was a woman living alone in the fields, I, I had, a, I had um, a boyfriend. I had a boyfriend, but I didn't know in the beginning how shall I call them the boyfriend, <laughs> the boyfriend, and uh, so I was with a group of children, and they wanted me to show the picture, so I showed them the picture, and it was very interesting the the, the situation that evolved because I pointed out this is my brother, this is my brother, and now if you have seven brothers, you've really made it in in North Africa because that's perfect. If you have seven brothers, I was all protected, and then who's this? And I said, I said, uh, um, my a word that means my beloved. And then they all started giggling, giggling. That was not the word I should use. So they said, Mahdoub, uh, he's your fiancé. I said, okay, he's my fiancé. And then another child said, he's your cousin. And then I thought, ah, oh, yeah, if he's my 
Of course, I could not have a beloved. I could have a fiancé, but if the fiancé is in the picture with my parents, it must be a cousin because otherwise he would not be in the picture with my, with my parents. So by and by I learned the words that I needed to use. So the next time I showed the picture, I never said beloved anymore, but also always my, my, uh, my fiancé and then I agreed if, that he was my cousin. And, but also they showed me the, the hierarchy of love. Who do you love most? And uh, I had to be very clear in not picking my beloved, but in picking my, my, my father, because that was the most respectful, and then my, uh, my mother, and then my beloved. So this was the hierarchy of love. So you need to learn the local vocabulary and small talk is very important. And you need to know also what is important to the people, what they're doing and what they're, uh, they're valuing. So if you don't know how to start small talk, you can always ask what are you doing or not even ask, but confirm are you mowing the lawn or are you doing this or that. And that's an opening by which people feel impelled to, to tell you more. And when you become more familiar with people, small talk is also um, necessary in order to get backstage to learn all the gossip and that's actually um, very important for people anthropologists interested in power relations because if you're interested in power relations they will seldom tell you face up but you have to learn it through gossip through backstage to uh, references to people to the way people draw faces or, or um, uh, react or don't react. So all the nicknames um, you only learn and the taboo subjects. Uh, for instance, in Algeria, abortion is a taboo. It's punishable by law, so you cannot ask women about abortion. But I can ask them about the plants they have in their gardens and they will point them out what they do with them and they say well you can make tea and if a child is is, is, is boisterous you can you know um, um, make him fall asleep with this tea but don't drink too much uh, uh, of this when you're pregnant because then the fetus will fall which means it's used as an abortion so in a way you can discover topics that are um, that are taboo subjects to talk about in, uh, in interviews. Um, for me, um, it was also very important when discovering the, um, uh, and I wrote an article about that, about the marriage payments, because in formal ideology, and in everyday um, uh, meetings, people talk all the time about the, bridal, the, the marriage payments that the groom has to pay to the family of the wife, uh, of, the, of his bride. And um, then they say, I've paid three million, two million for the wife. And the wife repeats, or for the wife, for the bride. And the bride repeats this because both the uh, the boy and his family, as well as the girl uh, 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 and her family, derives status from it. It's good if you make a lot of money on, on your marriage. But somehow it does not fit all the theories on bride price and dowry, because bride price is supposed to be paid in African society for the economic and reproductive powers of women. So this is a, 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 a and, and, and in North Africa, it's, the women are not productive, they don't earn money, so it's only for the reproductive side. So I wondered how, how this work, these marriage payments, and they are also not called, uh, you should not call them bride price because they're not really a bride price comparable to, um, to uh, Africa below the Sahara. But when I talk to women, what do you talk to women about? They sit at home, they sit all day at home, so you talk about the pillows they have, about the number of mattresses they have, about the gold they have, and uh, as uh, one sociologist said, well, this gold thing and marriage payment thing is not relevant at all, you know, why would you want to write an article about it? 
And I said, well, it is very important because it's the property women have and it's the property which, which they ne negotiate and with which like one woman used her goal to keep her husband out of prison. And since that time, the husband is always indebted to her because she kept him out of prison with, with her gold. It's their livelihood. And then it turned out, if you ask about all the cushions and the pillows, that actually the family of the, of the bride pays far more into the new, the, the, to be established uh, nuclear family than the husband's family. So although they all talk about the marriage payments made by the, by the groom, whatever the bride brings in is nearly the equivalent or sometimes even more than what the groom brings in but it's sort of hidden it doesn't exist it's it's not flaunted because it would be a shame to say that you pay more for for you bring more into the marriage as a woman than than the, than the man did so if we want to understand marriage payment at all, we have to have the time to patiently sit and discuss things that on first sight don't look very interesting, but that are very re relevant in, uh, in a theoretical sense, but also in the context of the life of, uh, of people. Lastly, if I may, um, uh, uh, Small talk is a gift to the uh, gift to the community because what can we better give than that people can laugh about us? They laugh about all the mistakes that we make. Uh, Thirty years after we first started in Spain, they la still laughed about the fact that I took uh, that I uh, I wanted a, a bucket, a pail because I wanted to paint the house, and then I asked for a, a, a billy goat. And the whole community still remembered it 30 years after and 30 years after they still they still laughed about it. So all this humor is going on in, in small talk. And uh, in the beginning in Algeria, I bought piles of humoristic comic books and I just was so disappointed because I thought they contained the core of of uh, Algerian society because they were political cartoons and everything. And I just could not understand them. It took me a whole year of small talk to understand the jokes. And in the end, uh, my, my study on the Algerian political cartoons and women in Algerian political cartoons, unfortunately, wasn't published because the book it was planned for didn't go through. But um, I had my own little uh, 15 seconds of glory when I presented this uh, this study in a in a conference in in America, and one Algerian man suddenly started to laugh because I explained the name of one of the main characters of the cartoon, and it was a very ambiguous name which has a double ne meaning. And he had known this cartoon or this series of cartoons for years, but never never thought about this ambiguity in the name of this character. And uh, so that was that was nice. And suddenly, I thought, ah, I was a little bit scared of presenting the results, especially with Algerians in the room. You know, did I get it right? Did I get the joke right? But it was nice to see I did. <laughs>